the United States, prison officials are obligated under the Eighth Amendment to provide prisoners with adequate medical care. This principle applies regardless of whether the medical care is provided by governmental employees or by private medical staff under contract with the government. Inmates have a right to health care under the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. It is not a right to the best possible health care, but it is a right to at least that level of health care that a civilized society would think necessary. Tragically, many inmates have long been denied even that minimal level of medical and mental health care with consequences that have been serious and often fatal. Inmates are forced to wait months or years for medically necessary appointments and examinations, and many receive inadequate medical care in substandard facilities. Serious mentally ill inmates languish in horrific conditions without access to necessary mental health care, raising the acuity of mental illness throughout the system and increasing the risk of inmate suicide. A significant number of inmates have died as a result of the failure to provide constitutionally adequate medical care. Today, the Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team goes behind the headlines on location in Wyoming with John Robinson, partner at the Jamison Robinson Law Firm, to show that all prison officials are obligated under the Eighth Amendment to provide prisoners with adequate medical care. In order to prevail on a constitutional claim of inadequate medical care, prisoners must show that prison officials treated them with deliberate indifference to serious medical needs. What is deliberate indifference? A prison official demonstrates deliberate indifference if he or she recklessly disregards a substantial risk of harm to the prisoner. Remember, under the Eighth Amendment, inmates have the constitutional right against cruel and unusual punishment. It's not a right to the best possible health care, but it is a right to at least the level of health care that a civilized society would think necessary. What kind of health care is covered? Many inmates in the prison system suffer from many different serious medical conditions including hypertension, epilepsy, diabetes, lupus, and kidney stones. Inmates also tend to suffer from high rates of mental illness and substance abuse. As inmates age, they need the same kinds of geriatric care that the rest of us do. Inmates have a right to health care for the full range of serious medical conditions. In this insider exclusive investigative special, we will visit with John Robinson who discusses how Sal Lucido got the justice he deserved. We will also get a better understanding to important issues like what does deliberate indifference to serious medical needs mean? And what kind of adequate health care is covered under the Eighth Amendment? John has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Wyoming and across the nation. He makes it his dedicated mission to get legitimate and truthful answers to what really happened to his clients in each case. He sees it his mission to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. John has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. His amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It is my great pleasure to introduce John Robinson to the show. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about what your firm practices, what type of law. Well, mostly we do, we represent individuals, uh, mostly in plaintiffs' personal injury cases. I handle mostly civil rights cases. I have been for about 18 years. That's almost all I do. Yeah, and you represent the individuals, don't you? You don't represent like police departments or, why is that? Um, we. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of principle for our firm. We've always just represented individuals. We're not interested in representing uh, entities, governments, uh, insurance departments, or insurance companies. And there's not enough lawyers like you to do that, are there? That's right, there aren't. You know, um, one of the reasons we're here today is we're talking about 
a case involving your client, Sal Lucido, correct? That's right. And it's a case revolving around the Eighth Amendment, yes? Yes, that's right. And it's a case about basically what it comes down to is um, what type of medical care are prisoners, uh, detainees, uh, arrestees entitled to when they're arrested by the police, correct? That's right. So tell our audience a little bit about Sal's story. Well, Sal, Sal was a, uh, um, and rest in peace, Sal passed away a few years ago, but Sal, Sal was a prisoner at the Wyoming State Penitentiary for selling marijuana. Right. He was just passing through Wyoming when it happened. Yeah, I, and I want to emphasize this. He happened to be in jail. Yeah. He was a convicted guy. Yeah. But this whole story is about even people who have been convicted are entitled to reasonable medical care. That's right. Right? So he's in jail. What happens? Well, I'll never forget the day Sal walked into my office. He was carrying a box of records that another law firm had gotten for him, and he didn't have the right leg. But his, his leg had been amputated below the knee. Right. And as he explained it to me, and as I went through the records, I learned that he was sent to prison to serve out a four-month term that he had left when he got revoked on parole. And he was a diabetic, and he got a foot wound in the prison. And it developed into an infection, and then it developed into MRSA. Uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus. And as he got closer and closer to his release date, he got less and less medical tra treatment because I believe, at least what we think we proved, is they were trying to get to his release date so they wouldn't incur the, you know, the cost of, cost of taking him. care of him. By the um, time they took him to the hospital, it was so far advanced that they had to cut his leg off. I was really astounded with was the fact that when he was in jail, they just did not treat him. The stench from his wound was so overpowering, rather than bringing in a doctor, they went out and bought disinfectant, right? Right, yeah. Sprayed the air. And they, yeah, and, and we had the guards come in and say they, they, they were so offended by the stench yeah. and they wanted him to get the care, but the doctors wouldn't take care of him and they wouldn't even see him. Yeah. They put him in a cell and brought in anti, uh, anti odorant, you know, disinfectant kind of sprays, and they put him in a negative airflow cell at one point. It shows that the doctors uh, had no, re uh, they had no record of any treatment for him even despite the fact it was very visible, right? It was, yeah. And um, another one which we're showing right now, which shows that the cost of treatment and injuries and future costs compared to correct treatment, I think were $578,000 to $1,000, correct? That's right. I mean, had they brought him to the doctor, had they treated him, first of all, he'd have the leg, correct? Right. And second of all, it wouldn't have these humongous costs. That's right. Now, he eventually had his leg amputated, as you said. Yes. And. I understand there was a doctor at the hospital that was trying to work with him to figure out how he would have to pay for the medical cost involved with amputating the legs, right? That's right. That's I mean, this right. is like astounding, right? Right. So when you have a case like this, and in his particular case, what were some of your strategies to try to get justice for him? Well, the most difficult part about Sal's case yeah. is that he was a diabetic, and it's not uncommon for diabetics to develop these kinds of wounds. And, these, yeah. and so, um, had, had this just, had he been a guy in the, in the general population, it would have been a really tough case. But the fact is, he couldn't get his own care. And as you mentioned earlier, the, the last 37 days he was at the prison, the doctor saw him only seven times. Yeah. And, and, and they, it became less and less frequent. And I guess if you don't see it, you don't have to do anything about yeah. it. Yeah. Could they really have saved his leg? We don't know that. Okay, but you don't have to prove that. We 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 don't we don't. You have, have to, to show that it's a possibility. Show it's a possibility, and they they cost him even the chance of saving his leg. What is reasonable medical care? Well, in the jail context and the prison context, it's it's care for serious. It's it's the standard is deliberate indifference to a serious medical need, and so you we so have, define that deliberate indifference. Yeah, deliberate means intentional indifference. So intentional ignoring, you ignore something intentionally. Yeah. When you know that the person actually needs the medical care. So let me ask you this: How do you prove this? Because if they're ignoring, like in Sal's case, you know the stench. He only saw the doctor a couple of times. How can you prove that the doctors weren't seeing him or that someone didn't check on him, let's say visibly? How do you prove they weren't doing their job? Well, we just had to get all the records and we took the depositions of the physician's assistant and the doctor. Yeah. And we were able to establish the exact days and times that they physically visited Sal in his cell or in the, in the medical unit and saw him. And, yeah. 
And uh, it, it was not an easy thing to prove yeah. because, of course, they claimed that they did everything they could. Here's a big question that probably a lot of people have is why should inmates be entitled to any reasonable health care? I mean, they're convicted. They're bad people. Well, they're in prison for punishment. I mean, th th their punishment is being in prison, but they're not in prison to get more punishment. That's a, a gen and, and it's a, it's and a they, thing. That people, but a lot of people think that way. Well, they do, but in, in reality, by not giving them the medical care they need, yeah. we increase the cost to society. Yeah. Um, what do you need to prove a prison medical neglect case? What do you need? Well, you need to have some pretty bad facts. You need to have some pretty obvious medical needs that were being ignored, that weren't being giving, getting treatment. Right. And it almost has to be obvious to the lay person, right? Right. Well, what kind of health care is covered in prison? Well, you're, you're, entitled to, uh, you're entitled to medical care for serious needs. So uh, I have another case where I had a client who had a heart attack in the prison, and they didn't take him to the hospital for eight hours, and he lost 75% of his heart. But everybody there knew he was having a heart attack. They had an EKG reading that said he was having a heart attack. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. If you hear those kinds of facts, you say, oh, my gosh, what do you mean you didn't? You did, all you had to do was take him across town. Yeah. But they waited eight hours. What do you say to, if you were in front of prison officials, okay, and you say, hey, look at every person who has been sentenced who's an inmate is entitled to reasonable medical care, what suggestions would you say to them? Well, part of the problem is they've, they've farmed this out to the private sector. Okay, and why is that a problem? Well, because you have these corporations that are coming in performing a government function, and they're only looking at the bottom line. So they're trying to save money. In, in many cases, you don't have staff in the prisons on the weekends or after hours. Yeah. And so if someone gets sick, if someone has an acute illness that happens after 5 p.m. on a weekday or on a weekend, yeah. it might be three or four days before they get to see anyone. Right. That's a problem, and it's part of the, part of the cost of privatizing public, what's supposed to be a publicly provided yeah. medicine. That, that's the first problem. And, and what are some other problems? Well, and, and beyond that, then you have to say, just treat them with humane. Just yeah. be humane, right? So let me ask you this question. When you say privatizing some of the services, because I saw, you know, recently in the newspaper, the federal government is giving up this private prisons, you know, contractors who contract with the government. Does that mean that they're giving up the privatization of some of the services like medical, dental, and that sort of thing? Does that mean it's given that up too? It, yeah, it's happened to both levels. I mean, even in, even in governments that still maintain they do all the work of, of maintaining the prison. They don't want to do the medical, so they, so they contract that out. Then there are the ones who enti the entire prison system is privatized. What percentage of your practice is, uh, focuses on cases that deal with uh, abuse with, you know, and medical deficiencies in prisons? Do you handle um, a lot of those I, cases? You know, I've, I've handled a handful over the years. I mean, it's not a big, por it's not a big portion. I'm, it's not to say we don't get the calls. I mean, people in prison tend to have a lot of complaints, and unfortunately, we can only take on so much work, and so we try to just take the ones on that we, that we believe we can make the most difference in. Right. When folks contact you to possibly represent them, what is the criteria you look for to handle a case? Well, we try to, we try to find out if uh, the facts of each case arise to the level where, number one, we can make a good business decision for our firm, but two, whether we can actually help the person. Okay, very good. Well, I want to thank you very much for being with us today, and congratulations on your the win. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.